The world is yours, Tim. Okay. All right. Um, all right, I guess we'll get started. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Tim Dempsey. I'm a member of the NAAC Housing Committee um, under the uh, able leadership of, uh, of Kellen Macbeth. Uh, unfortunately, Kellen is sick tonight, so I'm going to be uh, moderating the event. Um, so uh, I worked tonight to put together this event, um, which is kind of the second episode in what we hope is going to be a monthly-ish series of seminars on important housing and, and racial justice policies. Uh, our topic tonight is gonna to be uh, community land trusts. Um, so the context of this, uh, uh, many of you have probably heard and already seen that the uh, Arlington branch NAACP recently endorsed uh, the county's proposed guidelines for its missing middle housing program, as a part of which the county will hopefully finally begin to break up the monopoly of single family only zoning, which is a you know, legacy of racism. Uh, and housing discrimination, uh, mostly aimed at African-Americans and Black Americans. So, um, but as a kind of corollary, or that is the kind of uh, add-on to that, we are also asking the county to uh, actively, along with made changes in zoning, actively looking to uh, ensure kind of fair, equitable outcomes in terms of if there's new density being built, new housing being built, uh, making sure that that is, uh, there's inequitable, uh, equitable opportunities for uh, people who have historically been excluded from the housing market to to potentially uh, become homeowners or, or you know become get into those those new properties. Um, and one of the things we suggested uh, in that um, that the potential tool in that regard is for the county to a create um, what we're calling a kind of quick strike acquisition fund, whereby it would put money in a fund that could potentially buy land and housing when it comes up to the market, uh, and then to also uh, help. Uh, establish a community land trust uh, that would be a long-term steward um, of those properties and make sure that they're, um, you know, affordable in perpetuity, that is, you know, over, over the long term. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm really excited about this event because I've been, you know, kind of reading and studying uh, and uh, talking about this issue to everyone for, you know, the last uh, six or seven years, ever since I found out about, found out about community land trust. And, in those conversations that I've had with people uh, around the country uh, and here locally, um, you know, and, and all the things I've always read, they uh, usually one name always kind of came up in those discussions, which was John Emmaus Davis, uh, who is our speaker here tonight. Uh, and he is considered to be one of the foremost uh, experts on the topic, and he's, he's advised uh, land trust projects all over the country. Um, so just to give him a formal formal uh, introduction in his in terms of his bio. Uh, John is a city planner uh, whose writing, teaching, and professional practice uh, have been focused for 40 years on community land trust and other models of community-led development um, on community-owned land. Uh, he is found a founding partner at Burlington Associates in Community Development, a national consulting cooperative that has assisted over 120 uh, CLTs, community land trust, since 1993. He currently serves as president of the Center for Community Land Trust uh, Innovation and as editor-in-chief at the center's imprint, uh, Terra Nostra Press. Uh, his publications include On Common Ground, uh, Affordable for Good, uh, the Community Land Trust Reader, and, and this list could go on and on. <laughs> uh, he currently lives in Erling, uh, Burlington, Vermont, uh, where he served for 10 years as the city's housing director under Mayors Bernie Sanders and uh, Peter Clavel. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to kind of pass it on to John, who's going to open some introductory remarks. Um, and uh, we're going to, before we kind of launch into a, a formal presentation that we get into nuts and bolts about the community land trust, um, we'd actually like to show you a video that John had helped produce um, that uh, will kind of lay the groundwork. Oh, well, anyway, I'm going to let John talk and, and give the proper introduction to this video. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you to all of you for inviting me here this evening. Um, I'm speaking to you from Burlington, Vermont, uh, courtesy of Zoom. Uh, and I've been asked to give a, an overview, an introduction to community land trust. But I thought that before I talk about what a CLT is and does, it was important for all of us to have a sense of where it came from, um, to honor the vision and the courage 
of the people who pioneered uh, the CLT, oh, some 50 years ago now. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, several of whom you're going to hear from in the short film that we're about to present. Um, I was one of the, the film's co-producers, as Tim mentioned, but the real artistry is due to the directors of the film, uh, Helen Cohen and Mark Lippman. They're the real filmmakers. I was just the, uh, the agitator, the instigator, the gopher at times, um, trying to get it uh, made. Um, you know, I wanted to see this film made because around 1980, I had the privilege of meeting Charles Sherrod. I had traveled to Southwest Georgia, part of the country where my family was from. And I was working on a, a book about community land trust. And I was sent down there to interview Charles for that book about community land trust. And I was instantly uh, smitten by their story and about the model. They became my instant heroes. And I've spent the, the last 40 plus years uh, working on community land trust and telling their story. But I realized at a certain point that they were much better at telling their own story than I am. And I should get out of the way and let them tell their own story and their own powerful words because they lived it. They're the ones who created the community land trust. So this film that you're about to see emerged out of that desire to let the people who created the model talk about the model. I should mention one other thing, and that is that even though we shot something like 10 hours of footage uh, in interviewing the people who, who are featured in this film, the film itself is only 20 minutes long. And the reason for that is that we did not want to make an art house film. We were not making a film to, uh, to be shown just on college campuses. We wanted to create a tool that organizers and activists uh, could use in bringing the story, talking about the model in their own communities. So what you're doing tonight is exactly the way we had hoped the film would be used. And it certainly is the way that Charles and Shirley Sherrod uh, had hoped the film would be used. So this is their story. Let's hear what they have to say about it. The name of the film is Arc of Justice. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna attempt to share my screen to share this. Uh, if people could potentially just um, make sure your mics are off um, and maybe even stop your video just to make sure we have good, good bandwidth uh, for it, thanks. There were many African-Americans that were sharecroppers and tenant farmers in Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Tennessee. And when they attempted to register to vote, they were forced off of the land. They were living on plantation, living on some other person's land. You can help people fight for their rights, but when they don't have a base, when they don't have something that they own and they get kicked off the property, that's a really, really, really tough position. There was a screwing feeling on the part of so many individuals and leaders within the movement that if you had your own piece of land, you could do things. You wouldn't be dependent on others.
Charles Sherrod first went to Southwest Georgia in 1961 after the Freedom Rides to do voter registration in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Because you had thousands of low-income African Americans. They could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. We were building a better life for our people. We were always doing voter registration and that we were always doing direct action. George, we have been called upon and have heard the voice of democracy saying, get up from where you are and go to a land that I will show you all. When they begin to arrest us, we fill the jails in Albany. Thought that'd be enough for us to fill the jails. But they start sending our people to adjacent counties. One boy got his jaw broken, and one lady was kicked in her rear and lost her baby. A lot of violence occurred and a lot of hurt from our people. My father was murdered March 25th, 1965. He was murdered by a white man who was never prosecuted. I made a commitment on the night of my father's death that I would not leave the South that I would stay and devote my life to working for change. I was actually 17 years old, was not involved in the civil rights movement at that time, and didn't know how I would carry out that commitment. <laughs> I'd been hearing about this person, Charles Sherrod. I went to my first mass meeting, and I saw how he had led people there in Baker County to stand up and they were saying all of these great things in the mass meeting and planning um, for more demonstrations and planning the other things to be done and singing. Oh, the singing was just great. And I remember being in that meeting and just crying. And I knew then that this was a way that I could live true to the commitment that I made. And by June of 65, we started the Baker County Movement with the help of Charles Sherrod and others from SNCC. I woke up this morning in the night. I was canvassing on the plantation. I knocked on the door. They promised me they'd come to the mass meeting. They come to the church with their five children. They told me that they had been kicked off the plantation, had nowhere to go for the night. How many people whose doors I've knocked on got kicked out of their homes with their children without a job. And I was the partial cause of it. So I live in, in deep guilt and frustration. So that's how the spark of the need for land came to me. Seeing the land, uh, just the land itself, the beauty of the land, the purity of the land, and the acknowledgement that all power comes from the land, and the land comes from God. All power comes from the land. Absolute power comes from God. And that's my ministry. It's still my ministry.
Slater King played a key role. He was the only black real estate agent in the area, and that's how we knew that the Featherfield Farm in Lee County was available. It was 1969, I believe, when he was killed in a car wreck. Slater King and I were very close. Losing him was like losing the brother. So devastating to what we were trying to do, which meant that Sherrod had to step up even more if we were going to hold on to this. I hadn't raised any money in my life except a place to stay and, and food to eat. I was, uh, that's my only hustling capabilities. But I got on the road and kissed my wife goodbye. Said, I'm going to get this money. And I raised it. Somehow I raised it over a million dollars. The idea behind New Communities was to take civil rights one step further um, into economic independence and economic rights, using agriculture as the economic base. New Communities was near Albany, Georgia, in Southwest Georgia. 6,000 acres of land. It was the largest tract of land owned by African Americans in the country at the time. So it was a source of pride. I think black people, even if they were not involved, felt proud that, that we could actually get our hands on that much land. You know, land meant power. You know, land established you as somebody. It was a courageous and brilliant idea to bring people together in a new way of thinking, in a new way of doing something. Cooperative land ownership, not just an individual, but a community. Many of us during the early days of the movement, we spoke about and we talked about, and even today some of us still talk and preach about the building of a beloved community more cooperative living, cooperative buying, cooperative selling, cooperative, just about everything cooperative. We received a planning grant of nearly $100,000 from the Office of Economic Opportunity. So we've gone from fighting for our rights to now having rights and trying to do something with it. It was some exciting times, you know. You're planning villages, you're planning education, you're planning all of these things. You, you basically have a chance to plan a life and lives and plan ways to help our people. We had a list of 500 families who were willing to live on this land the way we proposed. You would own your home, but you'd lease the land underneath your home. Some of us were naive enough to believe that having been called lazy, not up to anything, ignorant, that white people would praise us that we're finally doing something for ourselves, on our own, with our own money, with our own resources, and sticking together just didn't think people would fight you when you were trying to simply help yourself. You're not asking them for anything. So I was really shocked at the opposition. I mean, they, they just came at us in every way to try to, to stop us, to block us, 
to, to do anything to get that land away from us. They shot in the offices. They diluted our fertilizer. They wouldn't give us loans. Washington had assured us that we would get the major grant to implement a lot of these plans that we had worked so hard to develop. But that didn't happen. Lester Maddox was governor of the state of Georgia when the money was officially vetoed. We couldn't build homes. We couldn't implement all of the many plans we had put in place, but we could hold on to the land by farming. And that's what we were doing. We grew everything from strawberries and sugarcane and collard greens and turnip greens and grapes. Part of my responsibilities was to market the hogs and the cows. We grew seed corn and soybeans and everything that could grow. We were doing quite well after a while. We could make enough money to pay the land notes and expand the farm operation. But then we had a drought, and then followed by a second year of drought. So we decided, just like all farmers were doing, to go to Farmers Home Administration to borrow money. The farm manager and my husband went over to the office in Dawson, Georgia, and the guy said, you'll get a loan here over my dead body. And he meant it. We actually faced foreclosure, and Sherrod was out traveling around the country trying to raise money. Well, we're about to lose our land. And that is a thing of uh, a lot of pain to me, to my family, to other, other families that are associated with this project and we don't see any way out of it. We were basically kicked off the land and, and what they did was they, they dug holes and pushed all of our buildings over in them. Every building but that main house and the shed that was on the property, they dug a hole and pushed them in. So we were gone. We want justice, Lord, come by We want justice, Lord, come by So many black farmers were losing their land because they didn't have access to credit. We would meet and we'd talk about the fact that we have to do something about black land loss. We need to file a lawsuit. We want justice. One of the heroines in this story is Rose Sanders. And, you know, here's this African-American attorney in Alabama dedicated to the idea that this can be done and that this case was triable and winnable. And she doggedly pursued it. We didn't hear anything else on our case until July, the night of July 8th. 2009. That's when our lawyer called our house. I answered the phone. She said, Shirley, have you heard? I said, no. She said, we won. She's all excited. You know, it's 10 years now, you know. <laughs> so I said, really? She said, you want to guess how much? I said, well, Rose is at least a million dollars. And she said, Shirley is 12. So it was just so Unbelievable. We were happy, and I think both of us cried. You know, it was really, really something. Just, we fought. We were hoping that we'd get something. But now, we could continue with the dream. 
the one suggested that we should look at Cypress Pond Plantation. So one Sunday morning, we came out here. We went in that, that big antebellum home, and I just had a problem with antebellum. Why would we want an antebellum home, a plantation? That place was once owned by the largest slave owner and the wealthiest man in Georgia. Then I started looking at this and saying, this is where we were supposed to be. What a statement to our people that this could go from, from a slave owner to descendants of slaves. We're just in the development stage. We got the pecans in production, about 80 acres of pecans. We're getting the irrigation put in on them. This year we're expecting a great crop because we will have water. My major was horticulture, and I, I've had a farm of my own. Uh, of course, I lost my farm back in 85 when we had a disaster, and prior to that we had a lot of drought. And uh, at the same time, the new community lost their property. And that's why I'm here so determined to make things work and do whatever I can. Losing the farm was torturous and very sad. But to have the settlement, to have this land, who could have predicted this road and this path? In some ways, it is the Ark of Justice. We all own it together. It's ours. We can actually start here to help people understand land trust, to help start land trust. Maybe get people to listen to us a little more when you bring them to this place out here now. They know everything is possible. We couldn't have done any better, I don't think, looking for a place after all of these years after the loss we've been through, to really help our people heal, to help get them training, and to get them working together for the good of all. We If it hadn't been if for, hadn't have been for well, if it hadn't if it been, been for, for my color, I, 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 I would have been, oh, been married, married a long time ago. Tim, that was the best part at the end there, yeah? that spiritual hymn. Yeah, oh, I'm ago. sorry, I cut it off. <laughs> uh, it's not your fault. You, you got to be a Southern. You got to understand that. But thank you. That was a great video. Um, yeah, so I, I hope everyone, I hope it came across okay. Um, I wasn't sure after I started. I hit play. I was like, I hope everyone else is seeing it. Um, so, I, I, I mean, the, the film is very powerful. Uh, you know, it, it, it's such an inspiring uh, and yet infuriating and frustrating, you know, story. Um, you know, it, it's, it's glad to see that. <laughs> and the Ark of Justice, obviously, here was, was very appropriate name for it, given, you know, what we've heard from 
MLK that the arc of justice is long, but it, you know, the arc of time is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think in this case that it, it, it did ultimately in the end. Um, but I just, you know, before I, uh, and yes, uh, we have a license for the film, so I can, I'll, I'll figure out how to share it um, if uh, people uh, contact me um, after this. Um, so, I, but I, I, before, you know, it kind of moved on, I just, I wanted to know whether the people who wanted to, you know, kind of maybe share reactions or share any thoughts about, specifically about the video or, You have a couple of hands coming up. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, Darlene and Marilyn Wilson. Uh, Darlene, uh, and uh, Wilson. Dar Darlene, why don't you go ahead and talk? Good evening, everybody. And thank you for letting me um, ask my question. That was a wonderful presentation. I have never seen that. And so thank you for tonight's presentation to us. Um, <clears throat> the question I would have would be, what would something like a land, a community land trust look like in Arlington County? So uh, we'll, we will get to that. John, John is gonna do a more kind of nuts and bolts presentation, but I, I, I just was wondering maybe this more, you know, maybe someone has uh, more kind of, uh, maybe just some, some reflections on, on the video. I didn't wanna just move on directly after seeing that, uh, but we would like to, to address, you know, the, the, the issue of the land trust. And I think John's gonna talk about that because uh, as you saw in the video, this is something that, that kind of had its roots in an agricultural community. Uh, but in the present time, you know, the majority of the land trust in the United States are actually in urban areas and they're focused on housing um, and housing affordability. Um, so, but we'll, we will get into that. Um, sorry, did, sorry anyone to, think, sorry. did anyone besides me think that 10 years was a long time for the anxiety that must have existed? So I could understand how she was saying that the lawyer was like, hey, we won. Uh, you know, guess what? And it's like, after you wait 10 years, do you really have a reaction or you wait 100 years or 50 years? Do you, how do you balance that out in a positive way without, you know, breaking people's spirits who've just won a victory? <laughs> yeah. Again, Marilyn. Oh, that was a wonderful, wonderful film. I, I, as I was watching, I was thinking, I can know all these people that need to see this film because it, it is so inspiring that people could, could and did these kinds of things. And of course, I have a million questions. How many of them are there in the country? Are there lots of them around? Do they have them in the Midwest as well as the South? Where are they? How many? How many people are there? How do they handle the the ownership issues, how do they resolve issues? I mean, there are just a million things that come up and it's just amazing to me. I am delighted to hear about this. You're muted, Tim. You're muted, dear Timothy. Yeah, no, th thank, thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're gonna get into that. I mean, I, I, it, this is, I wanted to, I should have started by uh, this, the whole, event by saying that we're kind of just treating this as a kind of introduction into, into land trust. It's a huge topic. And I'm sure John could speak for hour, several hours um, getting into all of it, but uh, we're, we're gonna hope to, to do some more in the future, um, uh, you know, in, in, on this topic and to kind of start um, you know, an actual kind of group that would be working on this. Um, so, um, I, I, so I mean, on that note, I, I'm just going to uh, pass it over to John now, and he's going to kind of give us the overview of you know, what the community land trust looks like in the United States today. Okay, I'm going to attempt to share my screen, and let's see if uh, always a little bit iffy here, but we'll see if it works. All right, how are we doing? Can you see my screen there? You're good, John. All right, excellent. You know, when you when you do this, you're never quite sure whether the technology is going to work or not. Uh, so, well, I'm going to give a um, kind of a, a quick overview, even though Tim said I could talk about this for hours, I'm not going to talk about it for hours. Instead, I thought I would talk about uh, community land trust for about 
you know, 10 or 15 minutes and then leave a lot of time for your questions because this is the sort of thing that really lends itself to good questions, some skepticism. Um, how does this work? How does that work? So um, uh, I'm going to just kind of lay it out there and then we will have a conversation about it. Um, so we just saw the story of the first community land trust in the United States that was created in 1969. They bought their land in 1970. And when they bought that land at that point, this was the only community land trust in the United States. There had been some precursors. There were some conservation land trusts. There were a lot of uh, cooperatives, but this was really the first, what we think of as the modern day community land trust. So if you think there was one community land trust in 1970, they're now over 300 in the United States. There are a couple of dozen in Canada as well. The model has jumped the oceans and there are uh, a number of community land trusts now in the global north. Um, in England, there are almost 300 community land trusts just in England. There are half a dozen in Belgium. There are 60 now in France, the French version of a CLT. And also they've begun to develop in the global south. There is a wonderful community land trust in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, and they have sort of pioneered the model in the global south. And they've been getting on the road and traveling to Brazil. They have met by Zoom with people from Kenya. So you think this seed that was planted by Charles and Shirley Sherrod and M. Tamanika Youngblood and those folks in 1970 has really borne amazing fruit across the United States and across the, the world. The organization that I work with uh, today that I spend most of my time with is called the uh, Center for Community Land Trust Innovation and you know, we use our website, we use our in-house publishing company, and we do a lot of virtual gatherings, uh, including World CLT Day. We will have the next World CLT Day in October of uh, 2022, in which we have folks from around the world that just volunteer to, to upload videos and photographs and testimonials uh, talking about their work. So. What started as one CLT and is spread out the CLTs all over the world is now kind of morphed into a worldwide movement of groups that are connected to each other and are supporting each other. So let's go back to the United States though and um, talk about the Community Land Trust as it's developed here and some of the features of the, the model. But I should also say that you know, not every community land trust is exactly the same. They don't all call themselves community land trusts. They come up with all kinds of inventive names. Um, they're applied in different ways. They're applied in rural areas, urban areas, in suburbs, on islands. They do affordable housing. They do many different kinds of, uh, uh, of development, not just housing, as I'll mention in a moment. So despite all of that diversity, um, you know, I would say there's kind of one generic definition that applies to just about all CLTs in one fashion or another. And this is kind of the elevator speech, the community led development of com on community owned land of homes and other assets that remain permanently affordable. And in that definition, you have kind of the key ingredients of the model itself. So let me talk about those circles that are there on your, on your screen. Starting with, you know, what do we mean by the C in CLT? You know, it's not a community that together kind of owns the land or leads development. There's a nonprofit organization that is controlled by the community. So it's the nonprofit that actually owns the land, but it's the membership base that controls the landowner, that controls the nonprofit. That voting membership is made up of people who live on the land, in the housing that's on the land, 
and then people who do not directly uh, benefit from the, the land trust. They don't live on the land, they don't live in the homes, but they live within the larger service area that, um, you know, in which the community land trust works. From that membership, the board is nominated and elected. And most community land trust boards are divided into three parts with the people who live on the land nominating and electing a third of the seats, people who live in the larger service area, but don't live on the land, they nominate and elect a third of the seats. And then they normally set aside another block of, uh, of seats for, oh, usually you've got one banker there, you've got some housing professionals, you probably have a government official, representatives of other nonprofits or churches. So a lot of variety around the country of how CLTs have structured that board. But generally, there's a membership, there's a membership that elects a majority of the seats on the board, and the board is kind of split among interests to have a certain balance. Now, most community land trusts in the early days in the United States were started like new communities where they were started from scratch, a brand new nonprofit corporation. But today, a number of CLTs are actually grafted on to pre-existing nonprofits, even churches, uh, community loan funds, Habitat for Humanity affiliates, pre-existing community development corporations that have an internal CLT program or a subsidiary, which is a community land trust, operating as a community land trust. So let's get to the real estate, uh, kind of the L in CLT. Um, you have this nonprofit organization that owns the land. But then anything that's built on the land or any buildings that were on the land when the land trust acquires the land are sold off, sold off to families, to another cooperative, to nonprofits, even to for-profit businesses. And what knits those interests together is a long-term ground lease. So the owner of the building holds a deed to the building but holds is a, uh, has a ground lease for the land underneath his or her feet, okay? And that lease is not your typical landlord-tenant agreement. It's very long-term, typically 99 years. The people who own the house, own the building, can get a mortgage both for the house, despite the fact that they don't own the land underneath. So it's mortgageable. And you can pass on your right to own the house and your right to occupy the land to your heirs. It's inheritable. Now, the example that I just gave you was a single family detached house on its own piece of land, right? And in fact, CLTs around the United States, around the world are doing a lot of single family houses, but they're also doing condominiums on leased land and limited equity housing cooperatives and rental housing. There's a lot of tax credit rental housing being built on land that's owned, managed by community land trust. And it's not just housing. Across the United States, community land trusts are also doing commercial buildings, um, facilities, service facilities. Um, there's a picture of a commercial greenhouse, the community land trust that the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative operates in, uh, in Boston. Parks, urban agriculture. I have this uh, logo for Bogas. That's a, uh, a gas station that is, uh, was developed by a community land trust in uh, Bolinas, California, and then a movie theater in, uh, in St. Louis. Basically, anything you can do on land, anything you can build, develop on land has been done by a community land trust somewhere in the United States. Now, the question is, why does a CLT hang on to the land? It sells off the building, but why does it hang on to the land? Well, it's first because it gives the membership that controls the nonprofit, an opportunity to basically say, what should happen to this land? How should it be used? Who should it serve? But not just who should it serve now, but who should it serve generations down the road? Sustainable development and equitable development go hand in hand in the community land trust. It's not enough just to build something good it's not enough just to serve 
people, boost them into home ownership, create something new on that land if that's going to be lost over time. So the land trust wants to hang on to the land, not only to give low and moderate income people access to the land and what's on it, but also to make sure that those gains are not lost over time. This is kind of the T in CLT. It's really, it's, you know, the land trust is not a trust per se, it's a nonprofit. But we, the T in CLT, the trust comes from the property is entrusted into the care of the nonprofit. It has responsibility for what is known as stewardship. And stewardship has three faces in the CLT. It hangs onto the land, it does stewardship, it watches over the buildings on the land in order to preserve the affordability of those buildings, one owner after another. In a homeownership situation, it's one homeowner after another, preserving the affordability time after time, owner after owner. Also stands behind the house to make sure that it is kept in good repair. And it stands behind the occupants of the building. So if they get in trouble, if the bank comes knocking at the door to try to foreclose on that house because that family has fallen under bad times, the land trust has a durable right to step in, to intervene, to slow down the foreclosure process and try to protect the security, the equity, the home of the people on the, on the land. The shorthand for stewardship um, I thought this was uh, one of the best quotes that I've seen in the, you know, one of my colleagues in the CLT movement from Connie Chavez. She says, we're the developer that doesn't go away. And the reason the CLT doesn't go away is because of the experience that many, many housing programs, many community development programs have had uh, over the years around the country where there were the belief was, well, you know, you could protect affordability just by slapping an affordability covenant on that. Sell off the land, sell off the building, slap on a deed covenant that's gonna protect the affordability, one homeowner after another, and that will be okay. But you know, the fact is there is no such thing as a self-enforcing deed covenant. Okay, well, people think there are, but it doesn't work. There are many, many ways to get around those covenants. So. The main reason that the CLT hangs onto the land is to be the active, diligent, watchful steward, not only of the land, holding it and managing it on behalf of its community, but also watching over the buildings on the land, protecting affordability, the condition, and protecting security of tenure. So why is there support? for CLTs around the United States. Um, quickly, they're kind of from three points of view on that. We can dig into it a little bit more, but in more affluent communities, more affluent neighbor, neighborhoods, the real impetus for creating a CLT comes from a kind of a dual concern for how do we serve the missing middle? How do we try to provide affordable housing and home ownership opportunities for those families that earn too much to qualify for most public support, most home ownership, most rental assistance? Um, you know, but they still don't earn enough to jump into the market. It's also being supported by affluent communities who worry about the fact that some classes and races are being excluded from their neighborhood. So if there's a commitment to diversity, then they are embracing this idea of the CLT. <coughs> Excuse me. In less affluent neighborhoods, there's been activism around CLTs to create a CLT so that if the neighborhood improves because of the organizing, the efforts, the development of nonprofits, <coughs> and citizen activists, you don't end up displacing the people who live there when everything was bad. You know, you improve conditions, you improve the neighborhood, and the first thing you've done is you've made that neighborhood 
more attractive to investors, speculators, people who want to move in there, who have more money than the people who lived there before. And then the third reason that there is a lot of support for community land trust around the United States is actually coming from government officials from above or from activists from below who say, you know, we have to stop putting money in to affordable housing, into community development. We have to stop using the police power of inclusionary zoning, giving density bonuses, tax incentives to try to create affordable housing, only to see those subsidies lost and those homes lost on first resale. Five years, seven years down the road. So CLTs are being adopted as a vehicle <coughs> to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to kind of plug the hole in the leaky bucket. <coughs> Okay, well, I'm losing, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, so I'll stop at that point. Great, yeah, sorry about that, John. Maybe you get, uh, we can excuse you if you need to get a glass of water. <laughs> um, so I-, I uh, All right, I'm back. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, with the the kind of like brief overview uh, kind of behind us, um, I'd like to move on to kind of answers and questions from the audience. If I have some moderator questions prepared to fill any gaps, but if uh, I want to give opportunity to um, to everyone in the audience to potentially uh, ask questions to uh, to the presenter. Uh, Looking for hands. Oh, we have a hand. Okay, Ian. Hi. Um, I, I just a question. I guess because in Arlington, like land values have been skyrocketing. Um, how do community land trusts tend to like respond to that kind of stuff happening? How do they preserve affordability in that context? Um, or like, does it not matter as much? So yeah, just curious. Well, it matters. I mean, you have a, a big threshold problem here of how do you get the land into the portfolio of the land trust in the first place. So you've got to get over that hump, either using public money, private donations, um, foundation money, or using something like inclusionary zoning to basically nudge, force, cajole uh, private developers into setting aside a certain percentage of the units that are gonna be marketed at a lower price. And then the land trust becomes a steward of those homes. But um, I mean, the problem is always, how do you get the land into the land trust in the first place? Once that happens, the land trust through the vehicle of you know, continuing ownership of the land and the ground lease is a very, very effective, durable instrument for enforcing, protecting affordability over time. Um, Tim, you have three um, hands raised. <laughs> All right, uh, how about Anthony? Sure, thank you. Uh, and thanks for the, such a uh, comprehensive uh, but relatively brief presentation. <laughs> um, the, brevity, uh, brevity is a virtue, isn't it? Well, it definitely is, but I, I but it means that uh, I didn't quite understand uh, how land trusts prevent the loss of homes created by inclusionary zoning, uh, density bonuses, and tax incentives. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, please? Yes, of, of course. Um, in most cases, um, the community land trust is given by the municipal government that is either given the tax break or imposed inclusionary zoning, um, given a density bonus, the land trust is then given the first right to purchase those units at the below market price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then they act as the steward over time. Anytime those homes go, come up for sale again, 
the land trust has the first right to buy those homes back at a below market price. And then they turn around and sell it to another moderate income family. Um, so one resale after another is managed by the community land trust. And because it has the right of first refusal, that prevents what? It, well, it has the right of first refusal, but it also has a fixed price option to repurchase it. Right. So it's not only uh, the first right to meet and match the market price of the house, it's a right to repurchase it at a formula determined price that is built into the ground lease. Yeah, and if that right didn't exist, what would otherwise happen? What would otherwise happen is that the family would turn around and sell it for whatever the market would bear. Um, but the land trust would still hold on to the land, but oh, you would have lost I the see. affordability of the I building. See. Yeah, that's, that's, that's excellent. Thank you, that explains that. Yeah, the problem with brevity is you go through, I went through this so quickly that uh, there are a lot of missing pieces. So thank you for these questions. Adrian, uh, Tim? Yeah, Adrian. Uh, Adrian Fikes, are you there? Okay, yes, I'm here. I, I wasn't sure you were calling my name. So thank you for this information. I'm curious, um, you mentioned that there's a difference between trusts and cooperatives. And I'm familiar with uh, what is it? Cooperation Jackson down in yeah. Mississippi and, you know, the, the Lumumbas and what they're doing. I'm curious to know what is the difference between a trust and a cooperative? And then the second part of that is if I wanted to begin a trust, how would I even like the land is there? How do I begin making that happen? Okay. Well, um, First of all, the, you know, the, the community, the organization itself, which is the Community Land Trust, um, trust is the name of it, but it's actually a nonprofit corporation, right? So it's not a real estate trust per se. It's just a, a nonprofit like you know, many of us are familiar with. Um, but in fact, and you know, let's, think, let's think of a 50 unit housing cooperative where um, you know, that's organized as a housing cooperative. Each member of that cooperative holds a share in the housing cooperative that holds ownership of all 50 buildings, right? I mean, all 50 units, yeah? Now, in, in a community land trust, the people who are members of the community land trust are not shareholders. They're voting members of the corporation. They vote, they elect the officers, they elect the board. Um, if, if the board uh, decided that they wanted to go off in a strange direction, the membership could get rid of the board. Um, so um, the people who are members of the community land trust don't hold shares in the land trust. They may hold a deed to a building on the land trust land. And in fact, um, you know, we often combine these models so that uh, there are a number of community land trusts where the nonprofit holds the land, but then there's a multi-unit building on that land, which is organized as a housing cooperative. So we can combine the models. And in fact, in Cooperation Jackson, they're doing some of that, where they've created a community land trust to hold land under a number of enterprises, and some of which will be organized as cooperatives. So you can combine the models. Um, Latanya McGowan, my, my apologies if I'm, if I'm slaughtering people's names. You're muted, Latanya. You're muted, Latanya. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Hi, everybody. I had some of the same questions that Adrian had, um, but I do have a couple more. So uh, who makes money in the CLT? I guess that's the first question. And then the second one, 
Do you know a situation where the CLT went awry and what happened? I mean, was it like, you know, between the members and the board didn't get along? You just said that they can get rid of them, but I'm sure there's situations where things go awry. So what is the scenario there? Uh, yeah, well, why don't I, uh, uh, let's talk about the money, first of all. Um, who makes money? Um, well, the only people who actually make money are the homeowners. They don't make all the money they could get as if they sold their house on the market, but they get back their down payment. So we're talking about the, a homeowner situation where they've bought their house uh, through the community land trust. They have a deed to the house. They have a ground lease for the land under their house, okay? They've lived there five years, seven years, whatever, as long as they want, but they decide they want to resell. At that point, they notify the landowner, the community land trust, that, look, I have an intent to sell. I want to sell my house. So at that point, the land trust looks into the ground lease, looks at the formula that everybody agreed on when they moved into that house and said, all right, we're going to buy your house back from you. We're going to give you your initial down payment. You get to walk away with all of the principal on your mortgage that you retired. You get a capital improvement credit. If you'd put in a, you know, if you added a bedroom while you were in the, there, you built a new bedroom, you get back that money. And we're going to give you a piece of the appreciation. We'll give you, we'll give you an inflator. Um, so you're going to walk away with more money than you ever would have walked away with if you had taken that same down payment and put it in a bank account. Mm -hmm. But you're not gonna walk away with 100% of the market price of the house. So by, by, by the land trust buying that house back at a formula determined below market price, they're gonna be able to turn around and sell it to the next moderate income home buyer for a below market price. Land trust doesn't make money. There are no investors mm. who make money, but the family does. Well, actually the bank probably makes money because they're, the family has gone to the bank and borrowed some money mm. for the mortgage and the bank always gets paid, right? But, right. Um, <laughs> um, and the land trust though is not, uh, you know, people talk about this sometimes as a shared equity model, a shared appreciation model as if the land trust is getting a bunch of money and the homeowner's getting a bunch of money. Well, that's not quite accurate because really the land trust is buying it back at a below market price and selling it for below market price in order to keep it affordable mm -hmm. for one generation after another. So that's kind of that's kind of the way it works pretty simply. More the, the complexity comes in what is that formula? And community land trust adopt different formulas to meet their own conditions. But you put it into the ground lease and day one, when that homeowner, that family moves into the house, they know exactly how the resale price is going to be calculated. You know, you have to be upfront with people. You have to be transparent, full disclosure. So as far as what happens when things go bad? Um, so community land trust are nonprofit corporations and they are tax exempt corporations in the sense that they've gone and they've gotten their 501c3 um, from the IRS, which means that even in a bad situation, they're not going to be able to sell off their assets and reward the people who are their members, reward the people who are on the board. So there's a certain protection there. Built into the bylaws is an obligation that another 501c3 another you know, nonprofit tax exempt organization is going to have to get the assets. They can't be distributed you know, to, the, to the members of the corporation. So another 501c3 is going to get the assets. In that meltdown situation, the ground lease still remains intact. So if the community land trust over here is going belly up and is being forced for you know, circumstances to liquidate its assets, dissolve and send its assets to another nonprofit, the homeowner is protected because the ground lease travels with the land. You know, they're not gonna be evicted 
because there's a new owner of the of the land. Mm -hmm. um, in a true meltdown, this has not happened in the United States, but yeah, who knows what could happen in the future? <laughs> Everything is crazy melt, these days. In a true meltdown <laughs> where nobody wants to take the land, the land trust is defunct. There's not another 501c3 to take over the assets. In that case, the homeowners, the people on the land would have the first opportunity to buy the land under their homes. That hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. but someday it could. We build in that escape clause in a meltdown situation. Okay, thank you. Fortunately, I won't say it won't happen. And there have been some CLTs that have gone moribund. They haven't gone defunct, but they stopped being active developers and active mm -hmm. stewards. So we've had a few of those. But I don't know of any situations where the people living on the land got hurt. There are a lot of protections built in to this model to first protect the people, second, protect the land, and only third, to protect the organization itself. If you have to give up the organization to protect the people and the assets, you do it. Okay, thank you. Tim, you have those questions coming. You wanna do Ann and then go to your chat box? Uh, okay, yeah, we can do Ann first. Ann, go ahead. Okay, hi, thanks for your um, very helpful presentation. How do you keep the money growing? Are you only banking on the appreciation of the land? And what happens if there's a market downturn? Although that's not something that would probably happen in Arlington. <laughs> it's probably not. Um, uh, well, um, let me let me think about the best way to uh, to say that. I mean, the you know a homeowner is is somewhat protected against the downturn in the market the fact that they have not bought at the top of the market and they have not bought the 100% of the full value of that house to begin with, right? So the land trust has already taken the land out of the deal. You're only selling the house to the homeowner. So right away, the home buyer is buying just the house, not the land. Secondly, um, in order to make that house affordable to a family at 80% of area median income, say, just to pick a, a, a target, the land trust has probably had to go out and get another subsidy to subsidize it even further. And then, of course, on the longer the house stays in the system across one resale after another, that house becomes even more affordable relative to the market. So even in a downturn, the equity of the homeowner is not wiped out. Um, at the worst of the, uh, you know, of the Great Recession around 2008, the incidence of foreclosure in the CLT world was one tenth that of what it was around the United States. And even when there were foreclosures, people did not lose their equity. The land trust bought them out, made them whole. Um, so uh, as far as how do you make it grow? Um, you know, the land trust can only, uh, well, wait, let, me, let me see if I understand your question. Are you asking, how does the land trust continue to buy more land and to expand and to grow that way? Or how does the original investment in the land trust grow? Can you give me a well, sense? Well, how of, do you keep a cash flow, positive cash flow for the land trust? Which uh, I uh, 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 that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the way the land trust pays for its own operations is first, they're charging a lease fee for the land underneath the house. It's not a market rate lease fee, but you know they are collecting something every month um, so that um, you know, they have a stream of income to help cover their cost of being a good steward over the portfolio, over all the homes, all the land that they hold. Secondly, at the time of resale, they're managing the resale and they're going to turn around and resell the house at a below market price. But as any realtor would, they're probably going to take like 2% of the sale price out at that point to pay for their own cost of managing the, the resale, of overseeing it. Um, 
And then other CLTs have arrangements with their local governments that if the CLT is going to be the steward, you know, the watchful steward over inclusionary units or units that were created through density bonuses or investment of, of public subsidies, then there are many CLTs that are receiving a, an annual fee from their local government to play that role of protecting the affordability that the municipality helped to create. Um, other CLTs are working with local lenders. Um, if they're going to help low and moderate income people become mortgage ready, then they're uh, able to collect a fee from local, uh, sometimes from local uh, banks to bring mortgage ready buyers, you know, mortgage holders to the, to the deal. So it's a whole variety of ways that they're covering their own cost. You know, it's a lot of streams of, uh, of a little bit here, a little bit there in order to support the organization. Thank you. I will say um, a number of CLTs are not just doing home ownership, right? They're, they have a diversified portfolio of rental housing and commercial property. And they're looking for ways to take um, some income out of those deals as developers, as managers of commercial property, of rental property, that sometimes, I mean, that will cover some of their staff costs that then will be used for other activities like being a good steward for the home ownership units. Tim, you wanna get into some of the yeah, chat? Yeah, so John, let me ask you a couple of questions that came up in the chat. Sorry to those who have their hands raised, but just kind of wanted to mix it up. Um, so the, the first question is, uh, I'm going to reword it a little bit as I understand it. Uh, the CLT can buy land um, you know, in, in any kind of zoning situation, right? Or, or is, it, is it in any way inhibited by various zoning situations in terms of acquiring land? No. I mean, the zoning controls the use to which the land can be put and the density uh, of the land, how much you can build on the land but there is no, nothing that prohibits this nonprofit corporation from going out and buying any kind of land anywhere in a, uh, you know, in a jurisdiction. Um, the second question is, um, uh, can a local government take uh, the nonprofit's land for some reason, i.e. imminent domain? Sure. <laughs> I wish I could say no, but uh, uh, you know, that's kind of the sovereign has the right to step in and, and seize any of our land under an eminent domain situation. Uh, but in that situation, if the land trust land was seized, just like with any other uh, property owner uh, where a, a municipality has exercised the power of eminent domain, the municipality would have to pay the land trust for that land that is being taken and pay a fair market uh, price for that land. Um, I would say that the community land trust would have a little more leverage in fighting the municipality and trying to get a fair price for its land than an individual homeowner. But yeah, if a, <laughs> if a city uses eminent domain, um, to take my land, it can use in the domain to take a CLT's land. Um, so the next question um, is maybe, uh, so it, it, somebody asked, uh, how, how does the community come together to form a CLT in an urban setting? Um, and I, I, would, I would like to add to that as a kind of moderator addendum. Um, and this kind of goes to the financing. Have we seen cities using things like bonds, for instance, to try to help? set up a land trust. Yeah, they've used a bond to build the housing on the land trust land. Um, so they've, they've done some of that. Um, cities have also created community um, housing trust funds, uh, you know, through different means where, you know, the, the money is in the housing trust fund. And then the disbursement of that money uh, is, there's priority given for 
land that would go into the community land trust. I mean, there have been partnerships of community land trust and public land banks and redevelopment authorities. Uh, that's the way land has come into the community land trust. So um, municipal governments have given land, they've given capital, they've used their regulatory powers all to aid in the development of community land trust. As far as how are they planned and how are they created, it's really a matter of concerned citizens coming together and um, being a de facto planning and steering committee to put together the blueprint for what their community land trust would be. Um, and to take the model documents that are freely available um, online, you know, through the Grounded Solutions Network, kind of the national um, advocate and organization representing CLTs in the United States. They have a lot of great materials on their website. The Center for CLT Innovation, we have a lot of free materials on our website. So, you know, steal our ground lease, please. You know, take the ground lease, take the bylaws, take the articles of incorporation and then tailor them to your own priorities, your own conditions, circumstance. You know, this is not a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise where every CLT looks exactly alike. Um, you don't have to follow a set of, of recipes to do this. I mean, you really kind of come together as a community and craft the community land trust that you want and you decide what you want it to do. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of coming up in time, but I don't, John, do you have maybe a couple more minutes, maybe take a couple more questions or? Yeah, of course, it's uh, kind of up to your energy and your okay. endurance here more than mine. Okay. Oh, okay. I, had a, a fr I had a colleague <laughs> once that said, you know, it takes a lot more energy to listen than to talk. I, I, are you okay with that plan, JD? A couple more yeah. questions? Yeah, let's go until, um, we'll, we'll go to 845. Is that okay, John, Dave? Of course. Yes, right. sir. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, uh, let's take some more uh, audience questions here. Uh, Valerie Smith. You still with us, Valerie? I was trying to unmute myself. Can, okay. can I be heard? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, uh, John. Um, I, I find your information very intriguing. Um, and one of the things that uh, I listened to very attentively uh, to you when you talked about why neighborhood support for CLTs, and uh, you gave those three options, you know, you talked about the affluent, uh, the not so affluent community, but also you talked about government. The one thing I know about Arlington County is that Arlington County is what they call a Dillon rule community. Okay. Uh, in other words, we have to get all of our approval for whatever um, uh, concerns the land and what have you, it has to come from the House of Delegates. And so in your CLTs throughout the country, has there been any type of barriers such as that? No, the barriers um, really either enable or hamstring the government that wants to support the community land trust. I mean, a community land trust is a, a not-for-profit corporation. So nothing about the Dillon rules um, hamper the CLT per se, but it can certainly hamper a local government in your state that wants to enact something like uh, inclusionary zoning if there is not a state enabling statute that allows that to happen, you know? So I don't know your situation in your state or with your city or what enabling legislation there might be, but at least for creating the entity, which is the community land trust, it's not a governmental entity. It's not even a for-profit corporation. It's a nonprofit that would be organized under your state nonprofit statute. So there should be no, nothing that would interfere with you creating the CLT, but there may be something that would interfere with your government wanting to act to support your CLT. Okay, thank you so much. Because the one thing that I did find out uh, through some of the housing meetings that I went to is that 
uh, our taxes are extremely high here in Arlington County and they want to keep the taxes high. So I'm trying to picture how that would work if you got like a, what you called it, you said um, inclusionary units or whatever, where it would be inclusive for people who are low income or moderate income. And thank you. Yeah, yeah. well, that's uh, <laughs> maybe the next time we have uh, have an hour to talk, we can talk about property taxes and how uh, how land trust uh, uh, houses and how the land trust land can be taxed because that's a, a whole that's a very thorny issue, and okay. um, we'd have to spend a little time on that one. All right, thank you. I would just add to that that uh, we have. A few land trusts have already been created here in, in Virginia, uh, and uh, well, I won't get into the details of it. The, the existing CLTs already worked with our legislators to get enabling tax legislation put in there that allows localities to take into account the fact that the land that is leased at below property and the, the housing is, is, is governed by uh, the, uh, covenant, the affordability covenant, which that they have to take into consideration. So that, that has been taken care of. That really helps. Yeah, uh, because um, we do we do not take land off the tax rolls, and we don't take land trust houses off the tax rolls, but we do want both to be taxed equitably, to reflect the restrictions, the encumbrances are on the land and on the building. So, but that's good if you've got that uh, that kind of a state uh, enabling statute, then at least your homeowners will be fairly taxed um, on what they actually own. Uh, I'll go for one more uh, hand question here. Um, Marian uh, Klimovsky. Yeah, hi. Um, the way I understand it with the missing middle uh, program that Arlington is considering is they're going to lift that single family housing zoning from all or most of Arlington. And so my question is, would a community land trust be building, buying these individual lots all over the county and, and does that work? Because what you presented in the film, it made me feel like it was like you needed 1600 acres or 800, do you know what I mean? If it's, if it's not adjoining property. That's a great, great question. Uh, no, in fact, the, uh, the CLT's holdings will be throughout your entire jurisdiction. Uh, you're right, from the film, the, uh, the impression that's left is that it would be only one block of land and you do your community on that one block of land. And in fact, that was what new communities did. But most community land trusts around the United States, particularly those in urban and suburban areas are salt and peppering, sprinkling okay. their holdings throughout the territory. And that doesn't throw off the whole structure. I mean, it, it operates as easily that, okay, thank you. Oh yeah, in fact, it's, it's I think it's better uh, because there's a certain, invisibility there you know you don't want to stigmatize people who are in affordable housing who are on the, the land trust land i mean here in i live in burlington vermont and we started our community land trust here in 1984 and um, we started in one neighborhood and then we went to citywide then we went countywide and now we operate in a three county area and our holdings for what's now known as the champlain housing trust are scattered throughout a three county area. And our portfolio has over 3000 units of housing. But that's single family houses, it's duplexes, it's condominiums, it's multi-unit cooperatives, it's rental housing, it's homeless shelters, um, it's office space, it's community gardens. So, um, but it's scattered throughout the three county area. Okay, great, thank you. Um... Okay, here, let's, uh, sorry, I wanna get back to some questions in the chat. Um, uh, as, oh, actually, sorry, there was one I wanted to ask about. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that comes up quite often in these dis discussions about the CLTs, especially in the context of, of trying to use them to the degree we can to repair um, past harms uh, that have been caused by um, housing discrimination um, and the kind of, basically the disparities between home ownerships between white and black and what that what's meant for inter intergenerational wealth so somebody had asked in the chat or had had asked for a kind of clarification about it, the 
the ability for people to actually build equity and to earn equity uh, as a result of this, you know, so uh, if you could maybe yeah, no, I know a, that comes up always in CLT conversations. Oh, no, it's a, it's a very, very good question. You know, is this kind of second class home ownership where people uh, don't have the, well, the sticks in the bundle of rights? They don't have all of those, those rights of a traditional homeowner. And the answer is, you know, you are a, a homeowner in every aspect of what you would think of as a traditional homeowner. It's just that you can't walk away with all of the subsidy that's been put into your house and all the market appreciation, but you do build wealth. You do walk away with a lot more money than you had when you got into this deal. In fact, in most CLTs, when you resell your house, you walk away with enough equity and enough longevity of tenure where you've repaired your credit, you've built some wealth that you're able to leap into market rate housing. And we actually studied that here in Burlington. You know, we've been around since 1984 and we've had hundreds of resales. And we, we asked ourselves, well, what happens to these folks when they resell their homes? And we discovered that uh, Two thirds of them, uh, when they resold their house back to the land trust after five to seven years, um, they had enough equity that they then could leap into the market and become a market rate homeowner with no restrictions, you know, just a traditional homeowner with no resale controls whatsoever. Um, another bunch of them bought another house in the community land trust. And then some decided they wanted to go back to being renters that home ownership was not for them, but, um, but they did build wealth. And the majority of them, two thirds of them built enough wealth that they could leap into the market. Whereas five, seven years earlier, they had no ability to buy a house on the open market. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to ask a couple of questions that I think you can answer quickly before I try to hmm. ask you a larger one. Um, have churches donated land for CLTs? Yes. Yes, uh, churches, government, nonprofits, indivi wealthy individuals have donated land for CLTs. Uh, another one from a realtor. Um, do lenders fund this type of housing? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, all of these, um, uh, you know, all of the home ownership homes in a CLT are mortgaged through private lenders. And most CLTs also use realtors, um, you know, to, to help with the buying and the selling of the property. So in many respects, so yes, you can mortgage it. Um, you do use private attorneys. You do use private realtors in these, uh, in these deals. Um, another one that you could probably answer quickly. Um, do do land trusts ultimately enable people to go buy on the open market or the, or the, the regular yeah, market? A, a majority of the resell do buy on the open market. Um, and so here's a longer one uh, that's interesting. As CLTs age, how are continuity and succession planning ensured? Are you seeing smooth, are you seeing smooth transitions in recruiting of new board members? Similar to nonprofits or family farms, do you see later generations not as invested as the founders? Uh, well, I mean, succession is an important question, you know, of uh, making sure that the next generation is just as vested as the one that created the CLT in the, in the first place. Um, what renews the CLT is the fact that um, as homes turn over, you've got a new group of homeowners who come into the land trust who are younger, more energetic, more vested in making sure that the land trust works. Um, and, but land trusts you know, have to constantly cultivate their membership and involve their membership, grow their membership over time. But remember too, that we break the board into three parts in the traditional CLT. So, no one part has control. So you're having to kind of renew and re-engage each one of those segments, the people who are in the homes, the people who live around the homes, and then a, a group of you know, do-gooders and professionals who, uh, who are appointed to the board for their professional skills. 
All right. Uh, I think that's it for the the chats. Uh, Anthony, did you want to have a follow up question? Yeah, make that uh, this will be your last the last one. Yeah. We're right at eight forty three. Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, John may have almost answered this uh, just now, but uh, I wanted to ask, in his experience, what really drives the success of a CLT? Is it is it the homeowners or is it uh, an enthusiastic um, uh, enterprising sector? You know, with shops uh, uh, in the CLT, or what is it that you know keeps it from becoming? Um, lackadaisical since there isn't anyone with a really powerful profit motive there. Right. But there's also nobody who's got a balance of, uh, you know, majority on the, on the board. Um, you know, it's a kind of a balanced board, mm -hmm. right? You've got that three-part board and you're trying to energize and renew each one of those blocks to keep yeah. them involved. You don't want any one interest group to be able to stampede the organization. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of divided the thing into a, a balance of, uh, of, of seats, but um, you know, you've constantly got to renew, you got to bring new people in um, from each one of those blocks. Um, so it's, you've you got a balance of interest, you know, it's a three-part board. Yeah. Superb presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And, um, you know, you've got some wonderful, skilled people in your area that uh, that you can work with on this. The, the Douglas CLT is, is near you. Um, the headquarters for the national organization, Grounded Solutions uh, Network, is there in Washington, D.C. Tony Pickett is the executive director, who is a talented, brilliant, articulate leader of that organization. So you've got some real skilled people right there in your backyard. Great. Um, thank you so much, John, for, uh, for giving us so much time tonight and spending, you know, sharing so much of your expertise. Um, you, you did not disappoint. <laughs> um, you know, we look forward to continuing the conversation and, and continuing uh, advocacy on this issue uh, as the housing committee and hopefully bringing in more people from the community um, in order to, to kind of make this uh, something that the county hopefully will take a, a hard look at. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended tonight. The questions were great. Um, you know, great enthusiasm. Um, I don't know if the Julius, if you have any closing words. Uh, John, we thank you for, for being with us this evening. And as Tim alluded to, this has been amazing. You know, here at the branch, we try to do some varied programming for our members and, and those in the uh, community. And this racks right, up, right there at the top. So thank you for your time. Really appreciate you coming out and being with us tonight. And uh, back over to you, Tim. Well, I, I, I think uh, I think we can we can close it out. So once again, thank thank you, John, and um, thank you to everyone who came out. And uh, have a good night. <laughs>